This conference will now be recorded. Hi, just wanted to welcome everybody to this John Howard Society Week uh, event. Uh, we're very pleased that uh, Mary Campbell is joining us and we're going to look at um, you know, developments around record um, suspensions, record pardons, whatever they would want to call it, and where this is going. I know a lot of you will do work in terms of supporting people who have criminal records, trying to ease the civil burden that they face because of having that criminal record. And I think we're very keen to make that a lot easier for you because uh, it, it really does handicap. But I look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say about what people have experienced and, and what would make it better. So um, before we get into it too much, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Mary, who uh, discovered a, uh, a further handicap uh, that's going to be imposed on Canadians with criminal records that we think you should know something about. Over to you, Mary. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yes, I came upon this really by accident, which is to no one's credit. It was in an email from the Canadian Automobile Association. So yet another good reason to have a CAA membership. Um, you know, one of the things that people with criminal records like to do, like anyone else, is to travel whether because they have family in other countries or they own property or they simply want to see the Eiffel Tower um, or what have you. Um, there is a new, um, well, I would call it a, a barrier coming into force in November of this year. I'll say at the outset, don't look for any information on the Global Affairs Canada website. Um, there's absolutely nothing there. And I was so annoyed that I emailed them and ask what's up and they replied in the most bureaucratic response uh, which is well we're consulting with partners and we'll let you know in due course well okay in due course whenever that is so what is this thing it is uh, a restriction on what uh, is referred to as the Schengen area of Europe now I don't usually say that I'm traveling to the Schengen area I usually say I'm going to Europe uh, but for those uh, of you uh, perhaps more in the know, the Schengen area is 27 European countries plus four non-EU countries, okay? 27 European countries and four non-EU countries like Norway. Uh, as it stands right now, Canadians do not need a visa to visit these countries. Uh, and indeed, people with criminal records, by and large, are, are able to visit without uh, any kind of issue. Canada and the Schengen countries have now formulated an agreement. And so you, uh, in order to qualify to visit, you will now have to apply for a visa waiver. I don't know why they just didn't call it a visa, because that's what it is. But it's a visa waiver. Uh, this waiver, uh, you can apply online and get it online. It will cost you money. Every single person in your traveling party, including children, has to pay a fee, uh, and it's valid for three years. Um, it's called, uh, the acronym is ETIAS, ETIAS, and if you just Google that, you'll call up the pages. It's the European Travel Information and authorization system, European Travel Information and Authorization System, and it is supposed to make countries safer. Well, okay. Um, the problem arises uh, in that people with criminal records are now going to face challenges in traveling to the Schengen area. Um, the details are not yet fixed but they've said that people with criminal records, particularly for human trafficking, uh, drug offenses that resulted in a two years or more sentence, and anyone with a conviction that led to a sentence of several years. You can see how vague this is still, although on another page they fixed that at three years. So anyone who's been convicted of an offense that led to a sentence of three or more years. Um, now, the difficulty at this point is, of course, you, so you fill in this online application, 
Um, and someone somewhere will apply these criteria. It sounds like they, the other countries will have access to possibly CPIC in order to verify your answer. Um, the, it will all be done electronically. And there's a suggestion that if you are granted permission, it will be somehow encoded in your passport. Um, this is quite alarming from my perspective. As I say, there are any number of reasons why people want to travel to Europe and, and that area. Um, you know, we have a colleague who is under a life sentence and wants to visit the uh, European battlefield where his father fought in World War II. It's a pretty normal thing to want to do. Uh, and as I say, you may have family over there. If you are denied, uh, there will be some kind of appeal mechanism, but I'd say that would be worth the paper it's written on. Um, and it's not at all clear if the denial will be some, in some way encoded on your passport. Now, this is quite alarming because right now, by and large, there's nothing in your passport that signals, hey, this person has a criminal record. So you can travel to many countries uh, with a record and uh, not face any barriers. If you want to go to say Bolivia, you've previously applied to visit France and were denied because of your criminal record. When you show up at Bolivia, is there gonna be something in your passport that says you were denied in this other country because of your criminal record, which will immediately alert Bolivian authorities in a way that they never would have had a clue. Um, the other outstanding issue, of course, is and most pertinent to today is, uh, will the Schengen countries respect our pardon system? This is the big unknown. Uh, as you know, if you want to go to the US with a criminal record, forget it. I mean, they, they have access to CPIC. Um, other countries don't have that kind of access. So unless you're some kind of, you know, uh, major figure uh, in the Interpol system, um, there's just nothing that, that the other countries have access to um, or anything in your passport that would, would cause a problem for you. Um, I, I, I really cannot believe that Global Affairs Canada is not out in front with this one. Um, I would suggest if you're working with people on CRA pardons that you move as quickly as possible uh, to get a pardon where possible on the off chance that the pardons will be expected or uh, will be respected. The other issue is, you know, for a, our colleague who wanted to visit a battlefield, uh, you know, go now um, because come November, um, it will likely be impossible. And of course, once these things are in place, you know, they never dial back. Um, that's the new reality. I've never been quite so happy about Brexit, I have to tell you, because of course, England, Scotland and Ireland are um, not in the European Union. So uh, that is not a problem for people who want to go to those countries. Normally, it's not a problem. Um, but if you've got anyone who's thinking that they're going to spend Christmas in Paris, and they've got a criminal record, um, not only will they have to pay a fee to find out if they're able to go, you know, this is the old, you know, it's an application fee, not a, a fee for the permit. Um, they will have to pay this undetermined fee and then see if France is uh, willing to let them in, notwithstanding. There's other vague criteria they've talked about that if you can demonstrate you're rehabilitated, well, okay. not really clear how that's going to be demonstrated. So it's in incredibly vague. I do understand in that sense, global affairs not wanting to uh, put it out on the front page, but um, I would think it would be more responsible to, to put it out there so people have some warning. I have no idea who the partners are they're consulting with. I would hope it's Public Safety Canada. I would hope they would realize that people with criminal records travel for very legitimate reasons, not just for lying on a beach. Um, 
Not that there's anything wrong with lying on a beach, especially today for anyone in Ottawa or area. Um, so there it is. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to try to answer them. I'll certainly keep Catherine updated uh, as I get more newsletters from the CAA about <laughs> how to get a tow and, and how to visit the Schengen area. I, I'm still just astounded that that's how it came to life. I found out about it. Yeah. Yeah. It seems, it seems very strange. I, you can imagine that there's still going to be a lot of people who are going to be surprised uh, who are making plans to visit family and have a criminal record and, and suddenly find out that they're, um, you know, probably already purchased their flight tickets or something, you know, and then find out they can't, can't go. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Family trips, what have you. I mean, obviously Canadians go to Europe a lot. Yeah. So um, I think this is going to come as a quite a shock to a lot of people. Yeah, I think so. And it's one of many, you know, impediments and frustrations um, that people with criminal records face that uh, we would hope that they, they wouldn't face. Um, so, um, you know, I think a lot of us are very keen to try and improve the system uh, for trying to relieve some of those civil burdens uh, that flow uh, or that hit people long after they've completed their sentences and are living crime, have lived crime-free lives. So, yeah, that is, um, as Mary pointed out, has been a priority for this government to see some reforms that would make that easier uh, for a considerable length of time now. Um, and I, you know, I became aware when I was um, spending more time at the John Howard Society of Ottawa, uh, I became aware of some of the real frustrations that, that John Howard people face when they're trying to help people with their criminal records. Um, and I think a lot of it um, has to do with the, uh, what's the word for it? Well, let me give you some examples. We, in fact, I would appreciate it if you could give me some examples of what some of the impediments are, since you're, you would be more uh, familiar with them. But a lot of the um, criteria seems pretty arbitrary. Like as Mary pointed out, how do you establish that you're rehabilitated? How do you, how do you persuade? And to me, it's sort of axiomatic. If having a criminal record leads to, um, you know, uh, non-protection from discrimination and employment and housing and volunteerism and all these other things, then how could it not be that relief from that is supporting your uh, successful reintegration? Like, why would you have to write a paragraph or so on explaining why getting a record suspension is, is going to support your rehabilitation? Like that that's incredible. The other ones that I found in, incredible were that um, the person meets the criteria and then they get a letter back from the parole board saying that their initial sense is that they're going to deny um, the application uh, because the initial offense was a violent offense and to give a, a to give a, a relief from that would put the administration of justice into disrepute, right? Now, Clearly, the statute um, has a different, uh, you know, a different waiting period depending on whether it's summary or indictable. So it, it contemplates that all offenses would be subject to this kind of, of relief if they're a finite sentence. And yet, uh, there seems to be this this sense from the parole board people uh, that the whole administration of justice would be thrown into disrepute if they gave a, um, it, you know, if they if they didn't, uh, if they stopped um, the the prejudice, the civil prejudice that flows from having a criminal record. So I don't know if people have any any examples that they would like to share with us on what some of the hurdles and impediments are. And then we could give you a sense of some of the legislative reforms uh, that have been tabled. Uh, and I'd like to get, uh, you know, your views on, on what would work well uh, in terms of streamlining or making the system more effective. Uh, so I'm, I'll open the floor. Sydney? Hello. Hi, Sydney. Um, I was recently denied um, a record suspension because uh, there was a fine that was outstanding that I didn't know about that wasn't paid from 1999. Yeah. They sent me that back and 
I found that it was not paid and I did pay it. Now they told me that the to reapply, I have to wait three years in order to reapply. So that's where I'm finding it. It's a little bit, I mean, I'll be 45 by the time I get to reapply for a pardon, which I haven't been in trouble in 23 years. Um, Sydney, if, if I were you, uh, cause this is, this has come up and, and, and there's a real, unf well, you, I, I don't need to tell you, but there's a real unfairness in, uh, in that many people don't know that they have fine outstanding, right? It could be a victim fine surcharge that was imposed at sentencing that you didn't know about, or it could be, it could be a lot of things. Uh, and it's not your fault, uh, really that you, you, you would have been, you did are clearly willing to pay the fine cause you've already paid it, but should it disrupt the crime free period? Um, and I think there's a sufficient amount of unfairness in that, that you might want to try um, uh, applying for a, um, uh, uh, through the Royal Prerogative of Mercy. Uh, and they, they do give uh, record uh, suspensions, uh, having looked at that uh, through the lens of the Royal Prerogative of Mercy, if there's something like that, like something that's definitely unfair. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, cause I, like I said, I've, I've, I've been through the federal system after 99 and that has not came up and there hasn't been no warrant issued or anything of that nature. Nothing about the fine. Yeah. Nothing about the fine. It only came up when I, when I applied for my, for my uh, record suspension. So I don't know how do I, you said that I have to, I could apply through uh, what was that again? The, uh, it's through the parole board, but it's the Royal Prerogative of Mercy. Royal Prerogative? Actually, yeah, there was actually, I'm thinking my, uh, yeah, I don't know uh, mind. There's a precedent for it. There's a precedent for it. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Um, where are you located, Sydney? I'm located in Windsor, Ontario. I was, uh, I was at the, uh, I was at the St. Leonard's house in Windsor, Ontario for uh, when I finished my sentence in the federal system. I was there for 18, 18 months. Michelle Graham is the one that is the one that um, told me to, to join this because you guys were having this session. So I was just uh, tuned in so maybe I could get some information on how do I go about, like you said, uh, uh, appealing that that decision on waiting three three years for something that was 99. What yeah. you want to ask for specifically is a, it's called a regular pardon. So very few people know about it. It's called a regular pardon? A regular pardon. It was used back in the summer of 2012 for a number of prairie grain farmers. Okay. By the Harper government. Okay, so it's, it's called a, a regular pardon. Regular pardon. You would simply write to the minister and explain, you know, uh your situation and mm -hmm. then ask for relief in the form of a regular pardon it is something it's not super easy you have to persuade the minister and the minister has to persuade um his cabinet colleagues and then it's issued by the governor general but it's okay. there and there is a precedent and i'm sure catherine could fill you in on uh on how that precedent operated okay and that's what it does. It just, a regular pardon just simply seals the record, the same as a CRA pardon would. Okay. I know um, John Howard, I think it was in Nova Scotia, was going was gonna to test one of those with exactly the situation you're raising, is that they meet all of the qualifications um, for a record suspension. You paid your fee and everything too, right? You went through yes. the whole thing. Yeah. And then they say, oh, whoa, whoa, look at this. We found a fine you didn't pay, so you got to start again. And it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem just. Uh, it seems, yeah. So I, I'd give that a shot if I were you, Sydney. Okay, yeah, thank a regular you. pardon, there's no waiting period. There is no fee. Uh, there's, there's no nothing. Um, okay, and, and how, do I, how do I contact them again? Is there? Right to the minister just write to the minister yeah and it'll be forwarded to the parole board because they're the ones that look into it but so it's I, Min so minister mendicino yeah right, right to minister what's mendicino. how do you spell it? can i spell that please 
I can try it. M E N D. M E N D. I N C I N O. C I N O. Okay. I will. I will. I will try that route, and uh, I will give Michelle Graham a call and uh, see if she can uh, there help me. Give you hand. Sure. Absolutely. Good idea. Okay. Okay. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Laura, you have your hand up. Hi there. Yeah. Um, I used to work with pardons years ago, and I did try Royal, Royal Prerogative of Mercy just for what it's worth, and it's tough because basically, I mean, that's the that's the like that's how you apply for a record suspension, right? It's the, it's the waiting period after you've paid your fine. So if they waive that for one person, they've basically done away with the whole requirements of a record suspension. So I think you do have to have a really compelling argument for it beyond just, I don't want to say just, but the fact that um, it, it's a terrible rule, but it is a rule that's applied to everybody. So um, my advice, Sydney, is come up with some reason why it's kind of undue hardship to you specifically. That's not why I raised my hand. Um, you guys are asking for barriers. Uh, something yeah. we've really run into is restitution payments. Um, they're the, I mean, same sort of thing. You got to wait for three years, five years, or ten years, on, and prove that they were paid. And we have people who owe like law laws Canada uh, because they'd stolen from a local um, franchise here in Newfoundland, for example, and that store is closed down. But parole board won't. You have to have proof that it was paid uh, or proof that they can't find it. And um, uh, you know, Canadian Tire MasterCard or the victim, the person that you stole from, you have to track them down who you're probably not in contact with anymore and shouldn't be and get some proof that you paid them back. It's just uh, like we're at a loss for how to deal with restitution charges or payments. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Let me think about that because there should be an easy way to do that, right? Like, um, Mary, do you have a... Well, no, I just wanted to, again, uh, Laura, I definitely hear you about the RPM route and the regular pardon. There is one person at the parole board who knows exactly what this is all about. It's the deputy chairperson is his title now. It's Daryl Cherney. Um, so, I mean, it's not the easiest route in the world, but Daryl was around in the summer of 2012 and he knows exactly what a regular pardon is about and why people got it then. And you're absolutely right. If everyone knew about regular pardons, a CRA would be out of business because it's a way to get your record sealed without any cost or any waiting period. Um, and it's a perfectly legal mechanism that no one, I didn't even know about it, I have to say, and I've been immersed in RPM forever and i did not know about it till 2012. Uh, it seems so, to me i read i read the annual report of the um parole board and they indicate that they they have uh, you know the number of successful and there's some there's some listed there and, and it seems to be mostly in terms of uh in relation to records so i think they do do it um but i guess it's not that easy um yeah. It took everyone by surprise in 2012, I'll tell you. It did, eh? So, yeah. Yeah. And the only person with any corporate memory there now is Daryl. So, yeah. Right. No, it took everyone by surprise. Okay. So, it's, I think it's well worth a shot. The other the other issue you raised, which is these restitution payments. Um, so, this would be part of the sentence that was imposed, eh? That the person had to make restitution for the harm that they did. Yeah. And then the waiting period starts then, but you have to prove it first and then pay and it. They, if they you didn't, can. Did they have to prove it to the court initially? No, it's just the letter. Not... Sorry, the letter comes back from the court saying um, it shows restitution charges. We have no record of whether they were paid or not. And then if you submit a record suspension application, parole board comes back and says you have to prove that the restitution was paid. Okay, let me think about that. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, um, forthcoming amendments, because that's that shouldn't be an obstacle, particularly if the person did pay it uh, and there's no way to prove it. Right. I mean, you're yeah. basically putting them in an ugly catch 22. Um, exactly. OK, let me let me think Thank about you. that. I didn't know about that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. Are there any other um, 
observations or, or comments about uh, unnecessary hurdles that you think that make the process more difficult? Okay, well, let's have a bit of a chat about the evolution of, of the reforms. Um, so, uh, as you know, uh, the um, Criminal Records Act was in place for a significant period of time. And then the Conservative government came along and they, uh, you know, uh, they made some significant changes, in, including changing the name of what you're getting from a pardon to a record suspension, uh, changing the wait times, uh, uh, making some offenses ineligible uh, for uh, for the pardons and, and whatnot. It became a became quite a mess, I would say, uh, and more difficult than it needed to be uh, as a result of those amendments. And so there started to be uh, some pushback. Um, and now it's it, there is a significant number of organizations who are supporting fairly significant reforms to the Criminal Records Act system. So um, the Liberal government had promised to do something about it. So they you know, put in the window just before an election, uh, an election period, a, I think it was Bill C-30 or 31, I may get the number wrong, in which they, they were proposing, uh, proposing changes, which effectively rolled back uh, the amendments that were put into place by the Conservative government. And uh, at that time, people looked at it and said, well, that's, that's great, good first step, but we think you should go a lot further in terms of making it easier for people uh, to get beyond the criminal record after they have discharged their sentence and demonstrated that they can be crime free in the communities. So um, there was a lot of chit chat about that, a lot of pressure on the government. They seem to be uh, realizing that perhaps they didn't go far enough in Bill uh, C-31, uh, but they didn't know how to do it. And um, during that period, um, Senator Pate put forward a, um, a bill, uh, which I thought was very good. I have been a, a strong advocate. We did some original um, research. We got some funding into John Howard Society of Canada, got some funding from the uh, Canadian Bar Association to do some research on how the Criminal Records Act should be amended. And um, I guess because my, my roots are in the youth justice system, where the records are just simply closed as an operation of law if the crime-free period is met uh, after the sentence has been completed. Say, so, well, that's a lot easier a system. It's much more um, it's much more secure. It isn't uh, liable to the arbitrary results that you get uh, from the applicate expensive application complicated process in the adult system and the, um, the duration and the expense and the, the whatever you get in the adult system. So we had been kind of, we had done some consultations way back about, uh, about promoting this sort of automatic closure of the criminal record as soon as the criteria had been met, make the criteria pretty objectively ascertainable uh, and, you know, make it, make it happen. Um, so I think at, Senator Pate's original bill looked very much like it was modeled after the youth justice system, which had the records just automatically being closed once the criteria had been met. Um, and I thought it was great, the first bill. And then she, she revised it considerably and she came back with another, uh, another iteration of her bill, which had um, brought back the, um, parole board as the decision makers around this decision as to whether or not a criminal record should be should be closed or expired or suspended or pardoned or whatever whatever the the question might be my view is the way the youth system works is it's the CPIC file that's um, managed by the RCMP that is closed and then it, it what it does is it controls access to the file so um, Police forces would not be able to do, um, you know, criminal record checks for, um, you know, employment or any of those other purposes once the record had been closed or sealed. Um, and, you know, there, as I said, anyway, 
so the bill was uh, a surprising reversal, I felt, the, the new version of Kim's bill, Senator Pate's bill. So I contacted her and I said, why, why did you do that? I mean, we know that part of the problem, at least I think that part of the problem is that the parole board has the wrong mindset for this. Like they really think they're very steeped in um, trying to manage a live sentence that's been imposed by the courts or through the exercise of the Royal Prerogative of Mercy um, affecting a, a judicial decision which had been imposed originally and, and reversing that. And so they're very cautious, very, very cautious, I find the parole board to be. Um, whereas there's no life sentence here. The person's already discharged their sentence. Uh, there's not no interference with the administration of justice. There's nothing in law which uh, propels or, or compels this kind of civil disability uh, that's imposed because of a criminal record. And so it seems a lot more logical uh, that this could be this could be closed or fixed as an operation of law without having an application process where people have to prove that they're rehabilitated and, and all of that other stuff that you people are so familiar with in terms of helping people with the application. So um, <laughs> Senator Pate's bill um, came back on uh, before the Senate committee just recently, and they called this before the holidays, I guess Christmas holidays, and they they called me and asked me if I would appear on the bill. And I said, well, look, are you sure that Senator Pate wants me to appear? Because I'm going to raise that, you know, I think there should be some significant amendments to the bill in order to make it efficient and, and blah, blah, blah. And they said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Senator Pate's really open here, whatever you have to say. And I said, oh, okay. So um, I appeared on the bill uh, actually Thursday, which was yesterday, I guess, with um, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, who is co-leading with, I think the John Howard Society, largely of Ontario, has taken a very important role with this Fresh Start Coalition, uh, which is trying to mobilize a sort of an automatic uh, closure through an operation of law of the records once the criteria has been met. And um, you know, some of you may know Samantha McAleese, who um, you know had been working at the John Howard Society of Ottawa uh, and was very frustrated or concerned about the Criminal Records Act uh, and then process in terms of getting people their pardons and their record suspensions. Then went on to get her doctorate at um, uh, I guess Carleton. Uh, looking at the um, the collateral consequences of crime, which includes this, uh, you know, criminal record stuff. So she, she was very good uh, before the committee at bringing the life experience of people and how having a criminal record and how, you know, having a, a failed attempt to actually get a, a suspension is, is devastating. Um, and Laura um, Berger uh, from the, Canadian Civil Liberties Association was also really good in presenting the position of the um, Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the Fresh Start Coalition, that there should be an automatic closure. It should be open to everybody. There shouldn't be scheduled of, schedules of offenses, that there's a different, you know, that some are not entitled. Everybody who meets that crime-free period uh, should be given access. And I guess the important thing to note is that the vulnerable sector registry is still there, right? So if you're if there's somebody with a history of sexual abusing or something, and they want to work in a daycare, or something that's going to come out on on the vulnerable um, sectors check. So um, you know there's already some safeguards in, in place for that, but that's a very small percentage of people who actually have records, and there's certainly the potential for streamlining this process and making it a lot easier. Is, is definitely there. Um, so the major thrust of what I think should happen is that it should know the, 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 the function of this should be still within the portfolio of public safety, but move to the record management managers of CPIC and taken away from the parole board uh, of Canada um, so that basically once that record, the criteria has been met, um, the record is simply sealed. Uh, if, um, 
if somebody, so this is what, this is Kim Pate's new version of the bill, uh, which um, I think arose because um, uh, the parole board uh, wanted it, was that if, if a person during the crime-free period commits a subsequent offense, is under investigation, or has been charged with a, another offense, uh, then um, the parole board, again, has um, exclusive jurisdiction or authority to determine whether or not uh, there is, uh, there should be a pardon or a record suspension. So some of it would be automatic, but there seems to be schedules of offenses that are included in this and not included in that. Uh, but some of it would be. But my concern is uh, that, you know, in the youth justice system, if you commit a subsequent offense during the crime free period, a lot a lot of people age out of crime, but it takes a little while. So they're they're criminally active for a while. They haven't addressed their addiction issues. They haven't done so on. So they they're they're building up a few convictions along the road. If that ever happens, then forever after, it's up to the parole board, and they're entitled to a review every year after that. But some of them will not have um, will will know that they're not in in line for a for record suspensions because they're criminally active. You know, they haven't they haven't put that lifestyle behind them yet. Um, so the, the way the youth justice system works is if there's a subsequent offense, then the, the, the timeline for the crime-free period starts again. Uh, so it, is, it doesn't shift jurisdiction away from the, the record managers at CPIC, uh, but it, it, it requires them uh, to, to recalculate when the new crime-free period would be and when they become eligible. So, you know, there, I think there's a lot of administrative hurdles uh, that would be faced with that particular amendment in terms of a unknown workload, which could be pretty significant to the parole board, um, when if you if you just waited until the person was out of the, out of the person's crime cycle, uh, the other system would work just fine. So, um, you know, these, this was the proposal that I, I put forward to the Senate committee yesterday was, um, well, in fact, it's under my notes. Um, you know, we appreciate the intention of trying to make it an automatic system, um, but the, you know, the way they're proceeding is not going to do it. So you really needed to make, um, for my view, uh, four principles to make that system work. First of all, you need to make it, uh, um, managed through the RCMP CPIC system, which should administer the criminal record regime. Um, local police force, because they'll they'll argue, well, you know, not all not all uh, criminal records are part of the CPIC file. That's fine. You know, if they don't want to, if they have a criminal record and the police don't want to, uh, don't think it's significant enough to file it with CPIC, then you should put a provision in there that if they're if if they propose to be sharing information, no, everybody's precluded from sharing, or local police force are precluded from sharing any information about a criminal record unless it has been filed with CPIC. Once it's been filed with CPIC, then you have to follow the the access rules and uh, closure rules that are associated with that CPIC file. Um, and once the sentence is complete and the crime free period has been reached, the record is closed and the police are prohibited from sharing any information about the criminal record except for investigative and uh, administration of justice purposes. So uh, a lot of questions were being raised at the, the Senate committee hearing on, on Senator Pate's bill before I arrived about, well, wait a second, what if you've got a guy who was a serial pedophile and, uh, you know, it just happens that it's been more than uh, five years since his last offense, uh, or which, whatever. And uh, you know, the 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 school reports that they're concerned because uh, a car has been hanging around the playground, uh, and this would prohibit the RCM or the local police from doing a, a, a check and seeing that the owner of the car had a, had a criminal or had a history of uh, abusing sexually, sexually abusing children. So they wouldn't be able to step in and, 
uh, you know, question the guy about why he was hanging around the schoolyard or whatever they happen to do if they believe that there's an inappropriate uh, behavior taking place short of a criminal offense. Um, so I thought it was important to say, look, I mean, what the criminal records people are generally concerned about is the social disability that people experience in housing, in employment, in volunteerism, in education, uh, because they have a criminal record. Those are the people that you want, you, you, you want to make sure that they don't have uh, access to a spent or pardoned or closed or whatever the term is used, um, criminal record, so people can get on with their lives. Um, it's not intended necessarily uh, to make it, uh, to shield accountability or due process or appropriate investigative uh, procedures uh, from uh, the criminal justice authorities, right? So they're going to have their police records anyway. I mean, when, when the youth justice system, we have a long chat about, well, is the policeman's notebook a record or can they keep informal information or whatever? They're going to they're gonna have certain information. The question is, you don't want them to share it more broadly to, that in a manner that prejudices people who have a criminal record. And if, if the person commits a crime after the record has been closed, then generally that, that um, record is, is reopened and the process of you know, serving the sentence and living a crime-free period and then having your record closed um, starts again. So, you know, I think that that's, uh, uh, that that's a clearer um, and more fair system. Part of the problem with the existing system is that once somebody has a pardon or a record suspension, the human rights codes across the country kick in uh, to provide them some level of protection from discrimination. Um, and so you want everybody to have that who's entitled to it. So we don't want people to be denied human rights protections because they meet the criteria, but they don't have the funding uh, to make the application or because, uh, you know, they lead disorganized lives and can't collect the, uh, can't navigate the complicated um, application process in order to, to get a criminal record check. The thing that you're aware of is that um, the it is particularly prejudicial, this is existing system, um, to people who have cognitive impairments, have led disordered lives, or impoverished and whatever. So that tends to be many of your, um, you know, indigenous communities, indigenous people, um, black people and others who don't get the same benefit of uh, having their record closed or sealed as other people who have the wherewithal to be able to, to do that. I'm sorry, somebody had their hand up there when I was speaking and I, um, if you'd like to pose your question now, that would be, that would be fine. My apologies for not getting it to her to it earlier. I believe Hi. it was chess. Yeah. Yes, it's chess. Hi, so, hi. Um, I have a question for all of you, actually. Great. Um, I have no idea what to do um, with my life, but I will say that it is a massive barrier. And I stuck up for my own life at the age of 36 against an abusive partner in London, Ontario. I fled an hour away. And I had a marketing job during the day, and I served on the weekends um, and at night because I've always been independent, despite me growing up in the cycle. So um, the system raped me. Um, I don't have any other better way to say it. Um, I was put on trial for two years in a hot spot where they moved me after being under um, CMHA. Um, I'd never even heard of PTSD. Um, I lost both my jobs, all three of my jobs, rather, while I was um, in jail waiting for bail. Um, they said it was only going to take a year for my trial. It took two years. In that time, um, my ex was still stalking and breaking in. This is the third house in two cities. Um, plus, people were breaking in with axes and lead pipes. And this is in a town I didn't know one person because I fled there. 
In saying that, during that time, the police kept coming and arresting me, and I had to keep pleading out. I never had a criminal record, and now I have a, a two-page record because I have brain injuries, and I was pleading out so that I didn't lose all of my belongings, and I had two rescue animals that I had owned for 10 years. I have no idea um, how this happens or happens that um, violent men are allowed to uh, um, be violent and I'm the one with the, the criminal record and I don't know how to um, navigate past that psychologically, um, physically, and I am one of those people with the cognitive issues from taking so much head trauma throughout my life. So um, I'm just throwing that out there to maybe um, ask for a resource or something of help on how to um, navigate to get clearance um, of some sort because I was uh, in college for 911 dispatch when this all happened. Sorry, thank you for your time. Where, where are you physically located, Jess? I'm in Kingston, Ontario right now. And I came up here after what happened to me in Chatham, which is where I fled from London. And my uncle that had raped me 10 years ago was in the military and was watching what happened in Chatham and offered his alleged resources up here in Kingston, to which I, I came up here um, and fled back to hell because um, he was doing it again. And it didn't matter what I did or where I went and what paper trails I was trying to leave. Um, I, I was tossed in jail up here, and in the document it says for throwing a paper file folder while I was sleeping. Um, he's an alcoholic, and that's okay. I'm fine with this because I. But it was I was trying to clear my name when he did this, and so. Um, I'm just wondering how. Literally trained murderers, <laughs> thirty six years two countries, um, don't go to jail and and. I do, and I don't know, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't let me, um, they would let me out on bail up here because I was a flight risk allegedly, he had all, he had everything, he had everything, I just took my artwork off of an art gallery wall for the very first time I had ever painted, I was painting my emotions and feelings because no one was hearing me and I felt like I was speaking Greek because the exact opposite was happening to me of what I, what I was doing and it just didn't make sense and uh, I was painting against domestic violence and that night I uh, literally had taken my artwork off of the art gallery wall and drove it uh, up here with all of the re remainder of my belongings and that night he threw me in jail here. And so that's two. Um, Men Chas I don't, uh, so, sorry. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think right away you probably need to contact or get, get some support in the community of Kingston for what you've been going through. I don't know if you've reached out to organizations there, but you can try the John Howard Society of Kingston. And, and what can, would I be asking them exactly? Sorry. Say that you need some, you know, you're, you, you've been in, you're in conflict with the law and you need some advice and some help and support. Okay? I'm not in conflict with the law anymore. I, I don't want that record. It doesn't belong to me. Yeah. Okay. Tell them that that you 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 know you've been saddled with a uh, with a record uh, and you 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 don't think it's it's particularly uh, just or fair or you could. It's try not that I don't think. I didn't know I could appeal it. <laughs> no one tells you anything. They just expect you to speak the jargon. But you, you uh, said so you, that you said you pled out, right? That you. So are you telling me you didn't? No, she wouldn't admit? put me on the stand. The first lawyer, she she said it didn't matter what I said, and I said I I I sat through that hot spot. You guys said it was only going to be a year. I I knew I could get through it because I was already six months in, after the um, mandated rehab. But I wasn't even the addict. My ex was, and because they found bottles of alcohol that were one was one was opened, and that was he drank it that night, and so. Um, I just don't understand, um, I just don't understand, and now I know why, and that's because I, uh, have post-concussive syndrome, like, I have head trauma, um, and I didn't know that until I read it, M McLean's article, so, uh, okay. um, I'm so, Laura, John, you, you've turned your camera on, can you offer any advice to Chas as to what she's doing? 
job isn't just record suspensions and you know help the legal system it's to connect people we're having a little difficulty hearing you i think sorry sorry uh working with the john howard society here in newfoundland uh just as an employment counselor even our job isn't just to help people get jobs and um and get record suspensions. Our job is to connect people with resources in the community. And Chaz, yeah. it sounds like your issue isn't just the legal system from all your trauma and you know not knowing anybody where you are, all these things, um, you, requ you require like a community around you. So um, I would still go to John Howard Society and you said, what do I ask for? I would I'm ask I'm not for willing you. to be the product anymore because I've been in doing this for five years and I'm not being tossed around anymore amongst these organizations just to be the is product. There a, so is there a domestic violence uh, organization you can be connected with because they deal with this right they have they have women who have been in your exact situation and might be able to They're advise students. and so anyone myself that's born into addiction and violence and childhood rape it's detrimental for me to continuously take these students and have to change every three months a counselor or a therapist okay. so in saying okay. that i'm fully trauma informed what i'm having psychologically issues with is the fact now that I have a violent criminal record which is literally turning me violent um, from fear of someone putting their hands on me or not being heard because it's just as damaging as other head trauma if that makes sense it does well, make sense um, Chas there so, is a way to get the the record suspended right or get it closed uh which is basically what we've been talking about but it takes a long time right have you completed your sentence i'm 45. <laughs> have you completed, have you completed your sentence i don't know what my sentence was i just pled out so i was on <laughs> bail and then i had to keep pleading out it didn't matter what it was in there for they they tried to put me in a raid. They came in with guns because I went to some girl's house. Like I took care of these people. I wrote a thing for the Canada Arts Council on how we could use mentoring and that they would take care of their space and use the arts and food and all of these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're using it now at the hub here in Kingston, the integrated care hub here. They're right. using literally my my programs that I literally designed yeah. during this hell. So I just uh. I guess I don't know what I don't know what I'm trying to ask. I'm just I don't want I, I'm not violent and I don't want to be considered violent and I I don't need police officers to come in with vests being scared of me and my voice because I'm petrified of them. Because yeah. no no one's gonna put their hands on me anymore. I just can't. I can't do it. And so when they see my name now, they come in and then they they have their hands on their guns and it's absolutely fucking terrifying. Excuse my language. So, um, so I'm just kind of looking for a way or some sort of hope. Um, because Lord knows the appeal process was uh, not good from having two different cities. I tried to do it myself. So, uh, yeah. So just the John Howard Society and I'm just requesting nothing because I, it's a violent record. So I'm 45. <laughs> so you, you basically want help with your criminal record then. Yeah, so you should go to John Howard Kingston. I'm sure they'd be able to help you out with that. Uh, but as, as Laura said, they'll, they'll, they could connect you with other resources too if you wanted them. Um, right, well, I, yeah. I'm kind of looking for, since you guys know the science and everything, wondering why that there isn't any, a program or something for people like myself that plead out with um, PTSD, uh, developmental disorders, and other things, knowing that we were not guilty. Okay, that's what I was getting at. So you you pleaded guilty when you weren't guilty? Is that yes. What you're and, you, and you then my it. lawyer forced me to plead guilty on top of those pleading guilties when I wasn't guilty, just so that I didn't have people that were literally, I was in a hot spot. They put me in the biggest hot spot in the county. I couldn't, I just. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, well, interestingly enough, they just introduced a bill today to look at miscarriages of justice. Oh, one of the big, one of the big miscarriages of justice are people being persuaded uh, to or leveraged to plead guilty when they're not guilty, right? Uh, <laughs> it's a big, it's a big, big problem, Chaz, and you and you you can see that it's very damaging to people. 
right? It I had them... to get the transcripts and they're too expensive to get because I wouldn't shut up in Napanee, whereas in, Lent, in Chatham, I kept quiet. Despite the judge saying it looked like I had something to say, but my lawyer kicked me when she said that. So I didn't say anything. But then when it happened up here, I wouldn't shut up. So I really wanted that transcript so that I would have proof um, or something. Uh, yeah, I think you, if you contact the John Howard Society of Kingston, I think that would be a good start. Okay. Um, okay. And what was the bill called, sorry? The bill the you bill? said just passed? Yeah. Oh, it, they just introduced it. It's uh, Bill C-40. Minister Lametti just did it on um, in relation to miscarriages of justice. It's, it basically is wrongful convictions. Up till now, they've only dealt with wrongful convictions uh, for uh, people who are looking at life sentences, eh? Like, um, uh, but this one should be broader than that. I haven't actually had a chance to read the bill yet, but I think it will be. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Okay, take care. Okay, um, are there any other comments? We've just got a couple of minutes left now. Um, are there any other suggestions of changes uh, that you would like to see in the, I know m many of you have received uh, some funding to help uh, with the with the applications as they now exist. Uh, but if you have any advice for me on on what could be done to help improve the system, I'd really like to hear it because uh, I think the the opportunity to influence what an eventual bill might look like is now. So um, if there are any suggestions, please let me know. Or if you have Andrea. Hi. Um, I just wondered about the schedules. You had mentioned um, there's a, a bunch of schedules, uh, or two schedules, I guess, in the current act that um, basically make it impossible for a group of people with specific offenses to, to get a record suspension. And you kind of mentioned that there were that that was good done away with by Kim Pate's bill in the beginning, but then it kind of came back. So I just was was curious um, where that stood. Um, <laughs> um, well, um, I guess one of the senators, uh, bless them, liked the proposed amendments that I had suggested, and so asked me to to provide her with some writing as to what that could look like. And in that, uh, I said, and, and this is the position of the Fresh Start Coalition as well, there shouldn't be any schedules. There shouldn't be people who are precluded from applying if they're the requisite length of time past their, uh, um, past their sentence, right? If they've committed the, or if they've completed the crime-free period. So um, it isn't in the it isn't in Kim Pate's bill now, but she phoned me yesterday and said she's totally open uh, to the amendments that I was suggesting. So hopefully it'll get through. But Senate bills are very hard to pass, eh? My other question, because I don't know how bills are really passed, you can call me, uh, I guess, ignorant in that way. Um, does the Senate bill then get bounced back to the House for approval or does it just get approved from the Senate? Um, for a bill to pass, it has to be passed by both houses. So once it's passed by the Senate, it then goes to the House and they would likely make changes and it would go back to the Senate. It get bounced back a couple of times, um, but it needs to be approved by both houses. Thank you. Sorry, Catherine, I'll just throw this in because we got two minutes and I seem to be talking the most. Sorry. Um, one other issue that we're running into is out of Canada applications. So either someone who has been deported uh, back to their home or somebody mm -hmm. originally from here um, who's lived in other countries over the last five years. Um, of course, a local police record check is required. I thought for sure if it was only Canadian cities that mattered, um, but we've learned that, uh, for example, if somebody lived in China, um, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, then you have to get local police record checks for, for those countries. And I mean, where do you go to get a local police record check in China? Um, no offense to place in China, but, um, you know, it's a huge barrier. And uh, whenever we've called the parole board, they've given us like um, Canadian border services, try them. 
and you know just random try uh, immigration canada I, you know they're not going to tell us where to get um uh, local police checks in these countries. So I, I'm not really sure what the relevance is on whether or not um, they'd committed a crime in even what could be a corrupt country to begin with, right? So I don't know, huge barrier for us as well. No, I hadn't thought of that. That's true. I think I think usually you're anticipating the person remains in Canada and then, you know, throughout this period. Um, yeah, but they would want to make sure that there had been no crime during that crime-free period, wherever they were. That's interesting. That's a, good, that's a good one. Also, th something to think about. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments, questions, suggestions? Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of the uh, all of the advice and the patience across the board. And um, you do important work when you start relieving people of the um, you know of the handicap of having a criminal record. Um, and I'm really, really proud of the organization that does such good work. Thanks again. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend.